with that title. And it's a real pleasure to be invited to come talk to you about some of the work of our trust. I've been asked to come along and talk to you specifically about our World Languages Centre and about how it came about, or what the ethos is behind that, and how we in fact address the education of our migrant communities in Boston and Southbourne area. And it, it, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to share that with you. I'd just like to start by saying that um, it started in 2009. And in 2009, we were lucky enough to win some EU funding to work with Finland. And the project that we worked with Finland on was a project called MILE, that was its acronym, and it stood for More Inclusion, Less Exclusion. And it focused particularly on how we were dealing in Europe with the education of migrant communities. And in 2009, it wasn't the situation it is at this moment, uh, but certainly, both in our community here, we've seen a rise in migrant children and in Finland, for those of you who, who don't know Finland well, you might find that a little bit odd, a little strange, but they also had uh, huge issues. Um, in Finland, they were receiving children, obviously, from the Soviet states, but they were also uh, receiving an awful lot of Somalian children. And they were way ahead of us in how they were dealing with these youngsters educationally. Um, we worked with a town called Wardu, and that was just underneath the Arctic Circle. And uh, when we first went up there, we went and visited a load of schools. And how the teaching of uh, migrant children was dealt with here at the time was really just to place them in a classroom. They called it immersive teaching. And I remember being quite horrified as a head uh, when I was asking about the kind of resources that were available to be just referred to dictionaries. And I thought, this is not good enough. You know, we really, though, though uh, in a way, chuck people in at the deep end, you know, the most able will surely swim. What happens to those who are not so able? So clearly we needed to rethink it. And this uh, monthly EU gave us the research opportunity to do it. What we found in Finland was the complete opposite to what we were doing in England. And we uh, looked at it and studied it with them and uh, commenced some trials and uh, the, our community trialed it with us. And after two years, we were absolutely convinced that this was the way forward. This was one of the two bits of work that we did, which are very integral to how we work in the World Languages Centre today. What we actually found from them was that they had reversed what we were doing here. They were taking the youngsters out of uh, linguistically heavy bits of the curriculum. So the equivalency here would be the children would not go into subjects like English, history, areas where there was quite a lot of tuition in the host language. But they would go straight in in an immersive way into educate, uh, parts of the curriculum where there was not so much linguistic need for that agility. So they would go into PE, they would go into drama, they would go into the arts, and that was beginning, if you like, their immersion in a very positive way. As the children became more skilled linguistically, they were gradually integrated into the full curriculum, and they would be, they would there, therein be supported, uh, resource resource-wise through the equivalency of TAs but also uh, developed resources which came from that particular centre. Well we just adopted it wholesale and our results for our migrant children shot through the roof. In fact they overperformed in terms of progress in all groups, all categories within the school. Um, another thing that we did though was as part of the research and this was this was later so it was as the work with the, with the finish was finishing, uh, we began to develop something which we called an educational passport for migrant children. And the reason why we developed that was it also became very, very clear to us that not enough information was being transferred with the children as they came to us. 
So, for example, a child that uh, had dyslexia in their home language, how difficult was it going to be for them to begin to learn the host language? Children who had social needs and social problems, children who had um, uh, speech and language difficulties in their own language, we needed to identify that and we needed to make sure that we were using the same approaches that we would use for children here who were not migrant, who had those issues and those problems, and we needed to make sure that we were catching them right from the word go and we were differentiating appropriately. So we began to develop uh, an educational path school for migrant children. And in fact, it went beyond, beyond Finland. We worked with Hungary, Spain, France and Czechoslovakia, and we, we put a bid in to try and actually put what we were really after, and I did lobby Tobias Aylward and, and the speaker actually as well of the House of Commons, because we were after getting it put in some kind of statutory form, because we really believed that uh, a means of collecting this information for children so that in, they could, schools could hit the deck running with the, with the youngsters was the way forward. It also had, a, had another purpose as well, because sadly, at this time, we also came across a young lady who had obviously been trafficked. And what we felt was, by doing that real joined up work between the school that the child had come from and the school that the child was going to, would mean that no child slipped through the net. No child would be migrant and not in a place of education. So we, did, we, we got the support, actually, of the Anki Jagger. Who, uh, who we went to work with for, for a bit. But sadly, it didn't go any further, but we continued to use it and we continued to promote it with other schools within the area. In the meantime, other things were coming into play and we got involved in the, in the Boston Regeneration Project through Achieve Together. And uh, the, the work that we were doing uh, was very research-based, so we had begun by looking at uh, differentiation with the children, um, and we wanted to do more of that. And we were lucky enough to win some, some funding from J.P. Morgan from the Achieve Together area. And it was at that point that the college also became very involved uh, with Boston Regeneration Group. And what we wanted to do then was we wanted to start to look at some of the issues that we were finding as well within our community, which meant that there was disengagement from some parts of the parent community. There was, uh, there was a difficulty also still with reaching some of our young people. And we still felt that we weren't giving them quite the educational um, diet that they needed. So J.B. Morgan enabled us to fund some TAs in the children's home languages. And what we also did was we also put in place some tuition. So where we had youngsters who, uh, let's say they were from our Portuguese or Polish communities, and they clearly had um, educational difficulties of some kind, they were then able to have TAs who spoke to them and coached them in their own languages, and tutors who tutored them through to GCSEs in their own languages, which built their confidence enormously. And these youngsters are, are still amongst the highest performing groups. And in fact, if you take English out of their suite of qualifications, which means that with the old headlines, they weren't hitting in the headlines because they didn't get the English, but they were getting four or five GCSEs at ACLTC level in uh, a variety of qualifications. We also did some work with Bournemouth School College because one thing that we wanted to do as well was we wanted to address the, the needs issue in our migrant community. And uh, what, we, what we found was that because they didn't have sufficient IELTS and so on and so forth, it was difficult for them to move on to FB. And so Bournemouth and Poole worked with us and we developed ESOL qualifications within, within the, the college. And so now all the young, youngsters who come to us from, um, from first generation migrant backgrounds, they do ESOL qualifications as well. And we work with the colleges to make sure that it's a very joined up pathway through. Um, where we are now is we've actually opened, um, opened that facility as a world languages centre. And um, we, we have a bespoke facility which we are now opening to our community. 
because the two most recent pieces of work that we have done with, with this <laughs> particular project um, are still ongoing, but have really opened our eyes to the fact that if we don't look to engage our migrant parent community in the right and proper way, we're probably going to find that we are hitting a glass ceiling. And some of our reasons for that was we started to notice that where we had children from deprived migrant backgrounds, we found that one of the reasons why that was becoming, if you like, insurmountable and it was difficult for those youngsters to get the resources they needed was because the lack of language in their parents meant that they couldn't access what they were entitled to. We find it very ironic that when we read uh, the, the terrible literature in some of our papers where it talks about migrant communities being here for, ben for benefits, when well, we know that very often they don't access the benefits because they don't know they're there because they can't read the literature and they don't have the proper support to get those things. So that is something that we are tackling. Um, we are opening our, our community doors and we are looking at ways in which we can translate some of the literature that's out there. And we also offer things like English for families. So we encourage the children to bring their parents, to bring their younger siblings, and we teach them English um, uh, in the same way as we do for the youngsters. And that brings me to another thing. The way that we teach um, English is we use the TEPL approach. We've all along, as part of the research that we've done, we've worked with language colleges in Bournemouth. And as you all know, we are blessed with language colleges here. We have such a rich resource in that. And they, they have been tremendous. They have not only translated into all of the different 26 plus languages that we have within our school community, because that's how many different languages are spoken. But they have also um, trained our staff in TEPL ways of teaching, because we have found that that's the best way to teach, uh, to teach our, our students. A lot of schools use teachers who have been taught to teach in England a variety of curriculum subjects to teach EAL youngsters, it's not the best way. Using TEPL approaches and teaching it as a foreign language is absolutely the best way to reach those youngsters. And we, we really did get an awful lot of support and help from them. And they're helping us with the translation for our community. Um, the final, final thing I wanted to say to you as well is another bit of, bit of research that came out of the work with the families. So from wishing to engage with families and from moving forward in, in that direction, um, we, we employ a lot of Teach First graduates at Inform. And what they have to do as part of, say have to do, I mean, I think it's a great opportunity, but what they, they do is when they come to the end of their teaching practice and they, they've got their qualified teaching status, is they begin an MA. And if they stay with you, finance that so obviously you have the ability to commission the research. So um, we also do a lot of other EU projects and one of the ones that we're involved <coughs> with was something called Pangea which involved our children travelling through Europe collecting urban folk tales to put together. It's a fab fabulous opportunity. They work with people from different cultures in their own country and they were travelling to Poland in, at this particular time. Um, to collect some urban legends from Poland. And this young teacher, this Teach First uh, individual was going out there with them and uh, she had started work with the head of the World Languages Centre, a lady by the name of Amanda Kelly. And she came to speak to me and said, well, you know, I'd like to do my research around this. And one of the things that we had started to look at was the problem that hybridity was causing in allowing young people to integrate uh, in, in the right way with their, with their community. And just, um, a, a I apologise if I'm teaching some of you to suck eggs here, but just a sort of potted thing of what hybridity is. It's the, it's the issue and the problem that's caused where you have first generation young people having to move between cultures um, in almost a day. So they'll be going home to one particular culture at home 
and then they'll be walking through the school door and operating in another culture. And that causes all kinds of problems for them. So what we said to her was, we want you to have a look at that. We want you to do some research into that and look at what the barriers to inclusion are. Not integration, inclusion. What are the barriers to inclusion? And uh, she has done a terrific piece of research for us. And she's found the most simplest things, because isn't that very often what it's about? And some of the, the stuff that they, yeah, because it's action research, some of the, the, the uh, bits of information that have come back from the children are things like, we don't get uniform. Why do they wear uniform in England? Of course they don't wear uniform in Europe. And the, the whole issue of wearing uniform and not having your proper shoes on, so, and the conflict that that causes the teachers, they found that very, very difficult. And then they were going home and trying to explain to their parents, who perhaps weren't supporting them with uniform issues. Um, that, was just, that was just one sort of very, very simple thing. Another thing which came out of the research was when she was in Poland, she noticed how informal the relationships were between staff member and student. And actually, I mean, that's, that's not a European thing, but I have noticed that we are probably one of the most formal nations in terms of how teachers interact with children. And it even came down to things like, which was an anecdote, that this young teacher came back with, was she said, um, she said, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. One of the teachers stroked one of the children's hair. And she said, you know, if we did that, we'd get the sack, wouldn't we? I said, well, you know, we probably ask some difficult questions. Because in England, we are incredibly formal with our children. And we do it under the banner of safeguarding and so on and so forth. And it's probably part of our cultural identity as well. Because I can imagine if, if one of us tried to stroke one of our children's hair, they go, oh, you know, oh, she touched me, what, what's going on there? And we'd probably have the parent banging on the door saying, what was that teacher doing, stroking my daughter or my son's hair? So it's a very different thing. But in Poland, this was quite normal. So they had this, this very sort of informal relationship. And that had issues for how those young people were coming into English schools and then expecting to behave and interact with teachers. And then the teachers were ticking them off, saying, you don't talk to me like that, or, you know, that, that's not the way you should be behaving towards me. So those sort of changes of culture and the crisis that that caused for young people was quite significant. In all cases, when they were asked how did it make them feel, they said angry. And the anger came from confusion. These are children, after all. They don't understand some of them. Some of them have got other issues as well. And they've been uprooted from their home. And they come into a situation where they don't understand what they, what they are seeing as rejection. So some of that research is really fascinating. That's going to all start in October so that it can inform their understanding of the children that they've got in the classroom. And hopefully it will build some tolerance for some of the things that they're seeing and also a means for them to open up about the teaching of the culture that those children are now operating within. Because the, the, that, has to, that has to occur. They have to understand it and they have to understand what the cultural norms are here in the same way as we need to understand the cultural norms that they're bringing to the classroom and to their experience in our schools are. So that's, that's where, where we are. Um, it's something which uh, we're hugely proud of, of our international work, um, because we, we do feel that um, what we've been able to do has really enhanced the chances of those children. As said before, they outperform in terms of progress all other groups within the school. And I think they do that. Uh, they do that for a variety of reasons, and we don't take all of the credit for it, because a lot of it is about the impetus and the drive that comes from home. Um, again, another piece of the research that came out was the feedback from the youngsters over how crucified they felt when they did get into trouble, because very often the thoughts and the feelings were that part of the movement here was to give them a better life, and part of that was to access our educational system. 
So there, there's a lot going on there for our micro communities and a lot, lot that we're involved in. One final thing for me, and then I don't know if people want to ask questions, <laughs> if we've got time for that, um, but just one final thing is that uh, the World Languages Centre is a school within a school, and the school is a school within a trust. And uh, the school that the World Languages is within is Avon Hall College, which is an international college, and it's something which uh, we really pride ourselves on, in terms of we do have um, over 26 different languages spoken there. We're a truly inclusive community, and we feel enriched, enriched and certainly um, inspired by the diversity that we have within our walls. It's something we celebrate, it's something we've always celebrated. We are in our eighth year as designation as an international school, um, so we've been, we've been awarded that three times. And we've also been awarded the Cultural Diversity Mark um, twice, so we're in our, in our fifth year for that, and we have that to the Diamond Standard. And um, long will it be, uh, because it's something I press for and I push for, because it's something which is very, very important to our schools because of where they are geographically and because of the community it serves. I just think that a school must serve its community. That's what it's there for. And it should be responsive to the community's needs, which therefore means its work is never done. Because communities are always changing. This community is not the community I arrived in 12 years ago as a head teacher at Amy Hall College. It's totally different. And it will be totally different next year and the year after and the year after. So it has to be an organic growth and an organic response to what is a very, very rich community. Uh, we're very proud to be Boston schools. I don't know if you have any questions. I'm very happy to answer any. Have any young questions on what they've dashed over them? Um, I've got a couple. <laughs> um, I mean, in terms of like, um, obviously funding is <laughs> quite interesting. You said obviously Europe's kind of provided the funding for some of the some project and things. Um, I mean, is, is, is that now, is that, is that kind of a kick-off stage? Or is this now, is this something that's going to continue? Or, you know, in Europe, I suppose you're already preparing for what might come. So, um, what's the, what does the future look like for you? The, the future doesn't look too bad, actually. We're in, in the second, in the, the, we're going into the second year of a very large funding project, uh, which has meant that uh, we, we decided that we wanted all of our staff to um, expand their own language skills. Um, for several reasons, not least we want them to experience what it is like to learn another language, but also we want to enrich the uh, diversity of, of communication that we have within the school. And we've got another year's worth of funding for that. Um, we have recently been notified that they intend to look for ways to continue what's called the Erasmus funding, because that's where we get it from. Um, it's research-based. So it's, it's dependent on what we do. But we did, ha we did have ready prepared, and we'll probably revive now having seen that, um, a project to look at employability in young people across Europe. And uh, again, we learn from our European partners, they learn from us. So it's very uh, reciprocal, the whole thing. So we're hoping that will continue. Sounds like you've got a kind of dynamic approach anyway, you're constantly looking forward, so you're not going to be sort of sat there looking at them and making things happen. No, certainly not. Um, John. Good evening, Jenny. <coughs> Welcome to Boston Forum. Thank you. My question is, today we've got a new Secretary of State for Education. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you know or not, but one of her family members actually taught me. Oh. So she's got a connection to the teaching right. profession. So I'd say, my question is to you, um, what would you like her to achieve and do in her new role as Secretary of State for Education? How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> I think it needs to be stability, and I think that reflects actually the country. I think uh, we all need something that is steady, steadies the ship, and allows us to consolidate the things that we have done in recent years. There's an awful lot that's been done, an awful lot, but I don't think that we have had the time and the space, certainly not in education, to embed it. And just as soon as you start to 
do that, something new comes along. So for me, I hope she gives heads the time and the space to embed the very good, rich things that we have done in recent years in education, because there's been some superb changes. There yeah, has, but is it, it's not the problem with government that because she's new in the position, she'll be looking to make, make a name for herself and bring in new objectives, new policies to, to show that she's yeah. making some sort of mark where the status quo is not acceptable. So that's why this constant changing of sec secretaries of state really, I think, undermines the education system a bit. It's, it's interesting, actually, because one thing we learned um, with our work with Europe, and again with Finland, and they, talk, they say Finland is one of the best education systems in the world. Um, the Secretary of State for Education equivalent in Finland doesn't change the government. They're there for five years, full stop. They do that job and sometimes they're re-elected. So the stability within the education system is there. It's not connected, it's apolitical. And that's, I think it's quite interesting fact. Does the, the, the kind of academy system, does that kind of give you, I mean, in terms of what you're doing as well with the trust, it, it kind of gives you a bit of your own room as well, so outside maybe what's coming from, from central government legislation in terms of education. Is that, is that true, that it gives you a little bit more ability to, to find a path and, and continue to do some of the work? Obviously, if, if fundamentally the academy's changed and in terms of what that meant was, then, then you'd be looking at something altering, but do you, do you think you've got a bit more resilience in terms of you know, time that you can spend on projects? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, uh, we're, we're quite traditional with the education that we give our children, um, and we have always been that way. So we adopted, for example, the English Baccalaureate back in 2010. So uh, we've been teaching that for a long, a long time. Um, we, we believe that every child should have access to the same thing. So our curriculum has a motto of, of access and equity. So each child should be able to get to the same point. But we also have a pathway system. So a child, for example, who might want to eventually get to university in their 30s could still do so with the building blocks that we give them at the colleges. Um, so that, that's our ethos, if, if you like. We've been able to do that, and uh, we did that actually working in harmony, I've got to say, might disappoint some of you, with government <laughs> legislation and some of the statutory changes. Uh, I don't think we have found them constricting at all. I think what we found frustrating is, and this isn't going to surprise any of you, the total lack of funding in Bournemouth for Bournemouth children is abysmal. We have got one of the worst per child funding areas, and most schools are in difficulty as a result of that. The government is doing the fairer funding formula. You asked, sir, uh, what should this, uh, our new Secretary of State, it's greening, isn't it, I think? No, Green? no. It's, is it? Oh, it's, in that case, I yes. apologise, I got the wrong way. Right, um, <laughs> and uh, what, one thing she could concentrate on is getting the f uh, funding formula in place and sort it out, because if we get more money coming to our children in Bournemouth, then we can start to really deal with some of the real issues of deprivation. I thought it was really interesting hearing Theresa May talking about, for example, white working class boys. Well, I have a whole school of them. Tell me about it. You know, we really do need some investment in those children. We really do. But, um, all the time it's left for councils to be creative, schools and head teachers to be creative to try and, and get that funding. We're always going to be not quite giving them the best deal because we do need to have that investment. So that's one thing that could happen. Yeah, right. I was going to say, we've actually got Nicola Green here, who's, who's um, I, I, what's your title, uh, Nicola? Your uh, Health and Education Services? Um, um, just in terms of that creativity, do you, do you want to say a word about what, you know, with those constraints, what, what, you're, what you're able to do with Bournemouth in that, in, that, in that world role? Thank you. Um, certainly I would agree with Debbie's point about Bournemouth being underfunded. Our names in pool will tell you how much worse they are, um, but it's a bit of a race to the bottom, actually, in terms of uh, the way that Dorset schools generally are funded. 
um, and we've, you know, through our labs and parliament, worked really hard um, to bang the drum for um, for better funding. So I absolutely concur with Debbie. Uh, where I think she's perhaps not been um, uh, banging her own drum well enough, um, and it may come with the breed, um, is the endless creativity of head teachers in managing budgets, um, recycling money. Uh, reusing <laughs> every possible resource to absolutely wring the very, very best from every penny. The way our schools are managed, I think, is um, is fantastic um, across Bournemouth. I, I, my, the way I first got involved in local politics was as a school governor, um, and the, the way in which heads do that and, and carry on with that absolute passionate commitment for their children is something I think is a, as a country which is so very, very lucky with. And that's as true nationally, actually, as it is locally. Um, Hello, Debbie. Uh, when you're talking about funding, I remember we had Teach First here before and then the Chief together, both doing presentations. Um, I remember one of the things they said was that uh, some of the London schools were doing much better, obviously, I think they're better funded, but there's also a, a better communication between the schools which was lacking down here because of the way they compete for pots of money. I don't seem to remember them saying something like that and get, get approach to the funding. I mean is the work that you're doing, are you sharing that with all the other schools in the area so that, so that we're all, that all the schools are benefiting from, from the great work that you're doing? Yes, uh, we're running a CPD uh, slot for teachers in other schools that they can, they can attend those. Um, certainly, the young people who attend English for families come from some of our primary schools here. To be honest, we mostly focus on our Boston and Southbourne schools and, uh, and do a piece of work that um, I've been doing on that recently is to visit all head teachers in the area to say that it's something that we need to look at. We need to look at uh, what our vision for the best education for our Boston and Southbourne children will look like. And do we work together on it? Do we make sure that as schools who serve that community, that we have got a vision of excellence for those children? And what are we going to pledge that we won't do? For example, you know, uh, will we have, will we have uh, a pledge that every child will have a place in the area? Will we have a pledge and will we work together on our admissions codes so that we don't um, allow situations where children do not have places? That's one thing that we'll be looking at together. Another thing that we're, we'll be looking at together is areas where children fail in one school, making sure that they don't therefore end up, especially can you imagine a child from a, a deprived, disadvantaged background, then having to travel all the way over to the north of the borough perhaps because they've failed in a school here to continue their education, they're not going to do it. They're going to continue to disengage and what we then find is that we then find that they are further excluded from education. So we're looking, we're looking at, we're going to have a meeting early in September, and we're looking to pledge together ways in which we can address some of those issues and share more collaboratively. Um, in a geographical area, we do meet as heads across uh, the conurbation within, within Bournemouth itself. Um, but we don't work together in a geographical way. But that's something that we're going to look at in the long term. Um, right, uh, Alan Mercer Sanger, Secretary of Boston Forum. And uh, uh, also uh, to say thank you, Debbie, to your colleague, Howard Curtis, who started work, uh, well, started work a little while ago on that by an initiative, Global Citizenship, to um, the work with Nepal. Uh, we're having a, a country of the world competition just concluded, prizes given tomorrow. So, on a personal thank you for that. Um, coming back to uh, the first uh, very interesting initiative you mentioned that you had at the school, the passport concept. Yes. Would it be possible moving on from that particular level to work with our, our communities, parents, children, to look at something like a um, global citizenship passport? Um, which could uh, equip all, all, um, all, all people, all students, uh, for working in the global workplace, you know, to help employability, we were talking about that earlier, uh, and obviously improve uh, competence of citizens as well, particularly after, you know, sadly what happened on the 23rd of June, you know, a divided country, bring the people together. So competence, 
in global perspectives in a, a, a passport around those sort of lights. And I think probably some of us would be quite happy from different communities to work with you. Um, actually from communities and maybe developing that, maybe that could be an outcome uh, or a, a legacy project from what you're already doing so well. Uh, certainly it's something, the actual accreditation of it is something that we can look at doing with our young people. But they do do an awful lot of work like that anyway. Um, we have, we teach global citizenry, it's in our mission statement, um, and it's in the mission statements for every single college with, within the trust as well, that we seek to make of them global citizens that have got a community heart and soul, that they believe very clearly that uh, that's, their, that's their first and that should be their prime focus. I, I hope that amongst you all, you, you have the same impression of our students that we have, which is that they are always fundraising, they're always doing things within their community. They really do have quite great hearts. At the moment, they're involved with the Rotary Club's Billion Acts of Kindness, working with Nobel Peace Prize winners. And uh, uh, what they, in fact, it's a, it's a Billion Acts of Peace, but how they translated it, how the children have translated it, is they said, well, we're going to pledge a million acts of kindness because a million acts of kindness are a million acts of peace. And they've got a big barometer in the reception where they just put their <coughs> pledges for kindness in. And those that are our children, they're your children. Um, they, they are Bosco and Southland children. And they really do have a heart for their community. They really have a large heart for their community. So I think finding a way to accredit it is a lovely idea. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Celia. Celia Pepper, teacher. I belong to Boston and South Paul Rotary. I'm dealing with you at the moment, I think, with the disadvantaged children in the holidays. Yes. Um, can I ask what is happening in your school um, to help these children who are not eating in the holidays and at weekends? Right. Um, okay. Uh, we have. We have an initiative now, I'm going to be a bit careful here, because uh, a pledge we've made within our school community is that we want no publicity for this, it's just something that we do. Um, but the staff, um, the staff donate from their wages to the food bank on a monthly basis. And what we've done is we've set up with the, with the food bank uh, an, an ability to issue children with vouchers throughout the holiday, so they will be able to access the food bank. I'm not right in believing that they only get six vouchers. They can and only, yes, apparently, they can only, that's all we're allowed to give them. So we still have a lot more holidays that you appreciate. Yes. So these children are not eating, yes. and I think they're lucky one the other day. Yes. And you've got the bed and breakfast children. Yes. The children on the street and the back of the yes. you've had, you know, where do they go and in this sitting in, we lose one-sixth of the children between um, the six right, September and December that are actually lost because they are moved on their transplant. Yes. That's 100 children out of 600 of the yes. here from here. Yes. Now, where are they and also what are they eating? And this is going to have severe impact on their learning, as you appreciate, yes. uh, on their learning throughout their lives. And it's a big thing that we are not doing with the proper in the country that no we're not we've not addressed this. I think it's time to do it. I, I totally agree with you. We're doing what we can because we're giving up and also the other thing, the other important thing, is the vouchers go to the children and the food bank will give the food to the children. And without saying anything further, you'll know why that's important. Uh, because then it's the children who are eating. So they're not eating to respect them. It's not it, it doesn't just happen in holidays, so no, no, no. it's but you know, it's all the time. We have a lot of children who are in appalling mm. circumstances. And that's why that's why the trust is working with the Boston Regeneration Project and that's why I've personally visited all of the heads in the Boston area. And said so we, we need to join together and we need to make sure that this is something that isn't dropped, it is not done, the work is not done, and it won't be done for a long time, and it may never be done. 
But what we have to do is make sure that the strategy that we have as educationalists is the best one possible, because education, I passionately believe, is the way to lift these children out of poverty. But if they don't attend, as you rightly say, that's a massive problem. And so therefore, we do have to, you know, it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, isn't it? You know, we have to address the lowest part. We have to make sure they're comfortable. They have their basic needs in order to access education. And if that's not happening, then uh, it, it's very, very hard. I mean, we have, the other thing we have in the trust is, I don't know if I've got time to mention this, is that, is that okay? Another, another thing we have in the trust is the Sarah Manners Centre, which you might have seen in the paper that we opened recently. And the reason why we opened that is because there, there are an awful lot of children um, who have those kinds of needs, and we don't have, and I'm sure we can all agree, we don't have enough spaces, do we? You know, it's something, the issue that we have within, uh, within uh, certainly Trigonwell and Fruit and so on and so forth, the, the um, institutions which support some of the needs of our children, they don't have enough places for some of these students. And what we decided we would do is that uh, we would cut off the bottom level of where we were referring those youngsters and we would keep them in-house. We would build a facility, we would work with the parents, we would have more and more meetings that went a bit more beyond our brief. So we do meet with health professionals, we do, we do um, do more of that kind of work than I suppose some do, but we do it so that we can make sure that that level of inclusion is something that works for those children and therefore we are managing that level, but you're quite right. And one more thing is people get through that at time to extent, but it's the people who are just above that level that don't get anything. Mm -hmm. We have them in our schools. I can tell you a hundred stories, hundred tragic stories. And uh, the most, I think, what we say um, in my schools is we say, know your children. And so that's our phrase that we say amongst us as staff, know your children. Just because they're sitting there looking as though they've got clean bib and tucker on, doesn't mean to say they haven't got an empty stomach, that they're not going home to a home with no parents, because maybe their parents are working or maybe the parents are doing other things. Um, they may be picking up brothers and sisters from school and going home. They may be the ones who are cooking the tea. So know your children. Know where they're coming from and make sure that you have that at the heart of whatever it is that you are doing with them. So if you're teaching them geography, yes, okay, but do it with an understanding of who that child is that's standing in front of you. Because if you don't, you're never going to reach them. So know your child. Very good. Um, last couple of questions. Anyone that's got a question? No? Oh, no. I, I do have um, some leaflets here. If people want about the World Language Centre, which perhaps I leave with you. Hello. Hello. Sorry I was late, Debbie. Hello. I'd just Hello. like to thank you uh, for all you're doing in, within the community in Boston and in the uh, local area. So, um, and in a kind of a, a pioneering and a methodical approach to education, um, which contrasts with a lot of other schools as well within Dorset. Uh, there's a lot of international links that you've achieved, but I, I, I didn't hear anything about your sporting links, as well as sporting links, unless you mentioned it at the beginning of your talk. Um, I, obviously seen in the school and everything good that you're doing, but are you going to progress on these links as a qualifying sports coach? I wish it's obviously with, within an obesity yes. problem, yes. within yes. not particularly within the local area, but nationally I'm speaking about. Are you going to continue these sporting links? I wish you could have been at an event. In fact, I shall, I shall give you all an open invitation for next year for the Sports Personality of the Year Award on Thursday where we were acknowledging the sporting activities of, of our youngsters. It was a packed hall because so many of them are engaged. We have more participation in sport uh, than we have ever had. We have a, a, a fantastically diverse approach to it. This Saturday, I'm going to go and see our boys row um, on the sea. 
um, in Sadsi. They were on the Stour and they won quite a lot. So they're hoping to get to Henley, our boys, for the next, and they will do. They will, because they've got real fighting spirit. So they do things like that. Um, they would bought some archery, so for the youngsters to do archery. And they do all the traditional sports as well. Uh, we celebrate within sport, gymnastics and dance, so that it's very inclusive for, for young women as well. Um, so you name it, we do it. We have a very healthy relationship, as you know, with Lithuan, and we have hosted international sports <coughs> events like the Courage Tournament as well. Um, so we open it out to our community in some of the different, different ways that we can. We're committed um, to dealing with child obesity, and uh, we have food plans in place in all colleges, um, and we make sure that um, the food offering is educational. So in other words, we're teaching our children to make healthy choices every time they walk into our school canteen. Um, the minute they step into school, it should be about education. Um, it doesn't matter what they're doing, it should be about educating them. Um, educating them to make the right choices, to get the right skills, to look after themselves, to be productive as uh, members of their community and to contribute to that social capital that we have in our community to do the right thing and to be aware of what is the wrong thing. I think if, if you talk to any of the children in the schools, you'd be very reassured that uh, they're encouraged in a healthy lifestyle. Let's go to this one and ask a question. Thank you very much. Um, what sort of provision do you have for children that have got disability or special education? Do you get some additional funding for that, but how do, how do you spend how do you invest it? in those young individuals right. to give them the best chances, the same as everybody else? It, it depends whether they come with an educational health plan. And if they come with an educational health plan, they come with funding. And then what we will do is we will, we will look at what their needs are and plan accordingly. The, um, the school itself, both the schools, the three of them, have to contribute something towards that. So it does make it difficult if we receive youngsters who only have a certain amount of hours because that means it has to come out of the school budget and there's no additionality that comes there. Um, we are an inclusive environment, we're an inclusive community and uh, we've had youngsters with a variety of needs. We've had, had children who are blind, uh, we've had, well, I'm not going to list them, just a variety of physical needs. We've had children and we do have children with, uh, with uh, mental health illness. Uh, that is probably our biggest concern at the moment for us, uh, not least because of the access to camps for children. It's not unusual for them to wait for a very long time and by that time their illness has progressed to a point where it is a lot more difficult for them to recover. So we, we, we have to deal with that. So we have things like, for example, the school counsellor. We have a full-time uh, college counsellor who children can access. Uh, we buy in services as well to supplement that. But clearly, with funding, we have to balance it. What we try to do is we try to skill our staff. We, do, we have a good-as-you-go approach to everything. So where we work with professionals, we learn from fellow professionals. Because then it will inform, okay, very small level, you know, we can't do the jobs of our other professionals, but what we can do is we can look at what that base level is and we can integrate that into our own approaches. So you did mention the uh, CAN service. So with the clinical services review sort of grinding and starting to gather steam again, which I don't know whether you've heard the clinical services review. Yeah. Uh, well, it's Pan Dorset. Uh, the clinical commissioning group are looking to change the way that all health services are delivered um, throughout the whole of Dorset. At the moment, they're in a listening stage, so they're consulting uh, the general public. And there's been a whole host of events over the last 12 months, and they're just about to go to a right, the final round of um, consultation. So I think it'd be well worth your while 
given those difficulties that you are finding in a very practical nature uh, with those young people accessing the education because their inability to access CAMS and it is about uh, their life at the end of the day. If they don't get the right um, support now, it is going to affect them for the rest of their days. I think it would actually be quite um, helpful if you gathered those experiences and passed them on to the clinical um, commissioning group so they could take that um, as a body of evidence um, for the clinical services review. Yes. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to have one more question <laughs> from Mark down the It's, um, it's more of a comment than a question. Um, I'd just like to say and, and repeat the, the thanks for the innovative and remarkable work that your team are doing. Um, I was aware of some aspects of it, but by no means um, in the depth that you've told us tonight. I'm sure there's a lot more. And I, for one, who, as no doubt we all do, because we're, we're showing our commitment and interest to what's going to actually be in this room this evening. Um, when one's constantly addressing the negativity of the perception of Boscombe, you know, and it's full of this and it's full of that, and how downbeat a lot of newspaper articles and certainly comments in newspapers are, I, for one, will be more informed and say, well, actually, yes, we do have a very diverse community. It's great, it's cultural, and we've actually got research, on a, 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 almost on a, on a world level research coming out of this. So thank you for that, and then um, keep up the good work. Thank you, you're welcome. Sorry, I can also like to say, London um, for me is quite open to the UK, from its all about culture. And I would also like to say thank you very much for working um, with us, um, with IAC. Uh, to produce a steel pan orchestra. <laughs> so, so thank you. Can I have a word with you about something else? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I think uh, the people, the individuals are expressing their thanks. I think thank you from the forum, especially, and uh, it's been very, very interesting. Uh, I think what's going on here. Thank you very much, David. That's terrific.